He'll he'll watch remotely. Uh, he hopes to. He's Maybe. got tire issues. Aye. Gosh. So, all right. Well, we. He's got the same traffic issues mm -hmm. I have. We hope all is good. Oh, freedom truck with the big uh, oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. So everybody's stuck because it, once you're there, you cannot go anywhere. Yeah. 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 You're, it's a tea. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Torah Study. So tonight we have a departure from our normal course of study. Instead of studying the Torah portion, we're going to be studying about the Festival of Lights. We do this on occasion when there's a holiday coming up. Oh, and I should also mention next week there's no Torah Studies class. Instead, we're doing the Chinese dinner and lecture, Christianity in the Talmud. So that's December 25th. So next Wednesday, we're doing a kind of an earlier thing, not Torah Studies. There's actually, in the book, there's actually no class for next next week. So they, they knew that what we were going to do. What time is your talk? The talk, we had a, we moved earlier. The talk is now at 4. I thought so, because the piece of paper had a different time. Yeah, different time. So the talk is at 4 now. The, the lighting is at 5, and the dinner is at, the Chinese dinner is at 5.30. The talk is at 4? 4 o'clock. Things, things change really fast. Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have oh. That's uh, Where is the lighting going? Lighting will be written about line right here. So let's talk about the Festival of Lights because what we have here is something that's very unusual. There's something, you know, holidays have their own traditions. And traditions are usually, as the name suggests, old, traditional, you know, uh, something that goes back a while. There's a new tradition, relatively new tradition, when it comes to the holiday of Hanukkah. And it's fascinating. And you may know what I'm talking about, perhaps. What I'm talking about is the lighting of the public menorah. We are just talking about public menorah lightings on the belt line. We actually, we had a staff meeting today, and according to our logis lo uh, logistics team, we already have four out of five giant menorahs placed around the, uh, the city. We have menorahs put up at Pond City Market. We have put up in Virginia Highlands. We have in, we're gonna do one in Atlantic Station, Decatur, and I'm not sure, I feel like there's one more. Oh, right here on the belt line. Maybe I mentioned that already. Anyway, there's, we have a total of five. Four out of five are already up. I'm not sure which four, but four out of five are up. So what's this notion of these big menorahs, these big public lightings? Before we jump into the philosophy behind it and the halacha, the law, the legalities of the, the jumbo menorah, let's take a look at text number one. Steve, we're going to jump straight in. This is from a beautiful book called The Rebbe's Army. If you haven't read this book, you might want to consider reading this book. It's a fantastic book published in 2009 all about the shluchim around the world, the Rebbe's Army. Text one, page 154, Steve. All in all, in that year, 2000, Chabad organized hundreds of public menorah lightings in 45 states in Puerto Rico and in uh, close to 60 foreign countries. In New York City alone, Chabad lit 30 giant menorahs in highly visible outdoor locations and an additional 300 throughout the metropolitan area. The major international lightings, Paris, Melbourne, Washington, D.C., Jerusalem, were streamed live on the internet by Chabad headquarters in Brooklyn, as was the movement's undisputed PR coup of the year, the almost surreal sight of Russian uh, President Vladimir Putin helping to light the silver menorah at Chabad's new uh, Jewish community center in Moscow. And he wished the Jewish people a happy and prosperous year. Yeah, so, and Putin is involved now. He's, uh... He's involved in the menorah lightings. So the question is like this. The question is, well, before we get to a question, clearly the public menorah lightings, lighting the jumbo menorah is a thing. It's around the world, internationally. It's domestic as well in every state, uh, pretty much, where there's Chabad, certainly. And so the question that we are going to ask is, are we comfortable with the jumbo menorahs? Are we comfortable with the giant menorahs? You see, many are and many love it, but some people are a little bit uncomfortable with public displays of menorah. Some people, what do they call it? PDAs, public displays of affection? This is a PDM, 
public displays of menorah. In fact, there have been several high-profile cases where the public menorah was even challenged on a constitutional level. Separation of church and state. Putting a menorah, sorry? Even, you're saying even locally. Well, there it's been challenged. It even went to the Supreme Court. I remember growing up in Pittsburgh, there was a famous case, I believe it was, yeah, 1989, Allegheny County. They agreed to put up the menorah in City Hall, and the, ACL, the ACLU sued the county to block it. Let's take a look at text number two. This is from the most trustworthy source that I know, Wikipedia. Text, this is a joke. Text number two. <laughs> David, please read. With the public display and lightnings of the Menorah. In 1981, the county of Allegheny, Allegheny. Allegheny, with the support of Chabad, won in the United States Supreme Court against the ASLU in the uh, county of Allegheny versus the ASLU over the display of a Chabad owned public Menorah. In 2002, the U.S. Supreme Court allowed Chabad of Southern Ohio to light an 18-foot menorah in Cincinnati Fountain Square. Justice John Paul Stevens upheld a lower court ruling that the city could not ban the menorah and other religious displays from the square. So the menorah has won out in multiple court cases federal cases that have gone to court, even when going up to the highest court. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. There, there, there are a lot of the legality of why the menorah was allowed and upheld in Pittsburgh, in Allegheny County. The, the, the majority opinion was that it should be allowed, but within the majority there were dissenting opinions as to why it should be allowed. So there's different rationales. You know, when you have a majority opinion, not everyone has the same rationale behind the ruling. The main thing is that you go by the majority ruling. There are different rationales. One, one of the strongest rationales behind it was that it's not necessarily a religious symbol. It's not necessarily exclusively a Jewish symbol. It's a, it's a holiday or it's a, uh, it's a cultural symbol. And therefore, if you have the other symbols, right, you have to have this symbol. You can't discriminate against symbols. That was uh, that was one of the one of the leading rationales behind it. But the truth is, today's class is not about the legalities of the menorah cases. It's really to discuss the comfort that people have with the notion of lighting a public menorah. Many people, like I said before, many people love it, but some people are a little bit uneasy about it. And the question that we're going to ask right here at the top is, why is Chabad so much about the public menorahs? What's wrong with just lighting a menorah in the house? You have a menorah, light it in the house like, like it was done for centuries, for millennia. Yeah, you have a menorah, put it in your window, put it in your doorway, put it outside, whatever it is, but what's with the outside, the, according to the Talmud, you put it uh, by the entranceway of your house, facing the outside. What's the message of the public menorah? What is the meaning behind it? We're going to explore a few different rationales behind it and hopefully come away with messages that not only explain the public menorah and the Chabad push for the public menorah, but perhaps more personally, it helps explain where we are in history and what our destiny, what our mission is, you and I, today. So let's jump into the first and basic rationale behind the public menorah. And that is what we would call the simple reason, Persume Nisa. Here is what the Code of Jewish Law says, text 3a, about the placement of the menorah. You see, when we learn the laws regarding the placement of the menorah, we might find a rationale that helps explain the public menorah as well. Sindrine, please read 156, text 3a. The mitzvah is to place a menorah light outside the door closest to the public domain. If the house is open to the street, it should be placed near the door. If the house is open to a courtyard, it should be placed near the entrance to the courtyard. If a person lives on the second floor and does not have a door that opens to the street, it should be placed near the window that looks over the street. 
In time of danger, when it is impossible to fulfill the mitzvah this way, it is sufficient to place the menorah on the table inside the house. So what is, so we have the last paragraph tells us in non-ideal situations what we can get away with. But what's the ideal? The first paragraph was the ideal. What's the nakuda? What's the point of the ideal? What's the objective? To show, to show the menorah. Yeah. To show the light, to share the light. That it should be on display. So the mitzvah we said is to put it outside the door, close to the public domain. So right outside your front door, near the door, near the uh, near the street. If you have a courtyard, the entrance to the courtyard. Second floor by the window. So the idea is that it should shine outside. If you can't, because by, by doing so it will be dangerous, then there's an allowance to put it inside. Why is it a mitzvah? Why does the code of Jewish law tell us that there's a mitzvah to place the menorah by the door, by the outside, or by the window at the very least? What's the rationale behind it? Rashi comments, not on the code of Jewish law, because Rashi, um, Rashi wrote his commentary on Torah and Talmud uh, well before the, the code of Jewish law was penned, but Rashi explains on the Talmud Tractate Shabbat, where this mitzvah is first formulated regarding the placement of the menorah, Rashi explains in text 3b, Sandrine, please continue one small text. Outside to publicize the miracle. Rashi says that what is the reason why the Ner Chanukah Menichah Al Petach Hasamach Lershut Harabim Mibachutz? Why do we put it Mibachutz? Why do we put it outside? For Mishum Pirsum Enisa, in order to publicize the miracle. Embedded. Inherent, intrinsic, essential to the mitzvah of lighting the menorah is not just to do your obligation, but to do so in a way that others can see. We don't find this mitzvah by another, we don't find this detail by another mitzvah. It never says in the code of Jewish law that when you eat your matzah, make sure you're running down the street. Make sure people see the crumbs of the matzah. When you're eating marar, Make sure those bitter herbs, make sure those tears are rolling down your eyes by the window. Never happened, right? What mitzvah do we have that says you put it by the door? I know, mezuzah. But you know what? That's still on the inside, sort of. All right, maybe a little bit on the outside also. But we don't find another mitzvah like shofar, right? Yeah, mitzvah, you hear the shofar. Where? What, we're supposed to like open up the doors of the synagogue every time we sound the shofar? Never heard that. But when it comes to the mitzvah, of Hanukkah embedded in the mitzvah part and parcel of the mitzvah of lighting the menorah is to light it in a way that others can see so the first and most, most basic rationale behind the Chabad movement toward public large public menorah lightings is simply because on Hanukkah, the mitzvah is not just to light the menorah, but to do it in such a way that we have persume nisa. Everyone should know about it. Jewish PR, right? Publicize the mitzvah. In fact, it's for this very rationale that we have another associated uh, detail of the mitzvah of menorah. Let's take a look at text number four. Joy, please read text four, page 157. We kindle the menorah in the synagogue and recite a blessing to promote the miracle. The Code of Jewish Law is telling us something interesting, and again, it's coming from the Talmud and classic halakhic sources. The Code of Jewish Law is telling us that in addition to lighting the menorah at your home, there's also a communal menorah lit in the synagogue. Again, it's not so intuitive, because you would think the mitzvah is, not you would think, the mitzvah is that every home should have a menorah. What about a synagogue? Who needs a, who needs a menorah in the synagogue? And yet, Code of Jewish Law says, no. You have to put a menorah in the synagogue, and then after mincha, in the afternoon, toward the evening prayers, you light the menorah with a blessing. You see that? Whose house is it? Whose house is it? It's a communal space. Hashem's, God's house, but it's a communal space. And because the mitzvah, is to publicize the miracle. Part of the mitzvah is to publicize it. So we do it in a community center, i.e. a synagogue, and we say a blessing because that constitutes the mitzvah as well as, for, as well as with the family at home. So if you're in synagogue, after the mincha prayers, we light the menorah, we say the blessing, and then a little bit later you go home and you do it again. 
So you, you bless twice? Well, the question is the person who blesses in the synagogue, can they come home and bless it again for the home? It's been a while since I, uh, I looked through all the laws of this. My recollection is that the answer is yes, because one is for this and one is for that. One is for the home. The mitzvah is on the home also. Unless you, you cannot do Santa Cruz. Maybe. Well, what if it's only, what if there's no one else in the household? I would imagine Shechiyon, or you couldn't reset again for the first day, I would imagine. It's a good question. I can't say definitively without being refreshed with that law. But the bottom line is we light it in the synagogue for the express reason of the same thing pursuing Isa. And again, what, what comes out of this is that the mitzvah is not just to light the menorah, but to light it in a public way. So therefore, we can easily understand that today, when there are, although many Jews do gather in synagogues on a daily basis, well, that's true. There are also, at the same time, many Jews who don't daily gather in a synagogue, right? It's possible. So therefore, how do we fulfill the communal lighting that back in the day would happen in the synagogue? So now we can understand, perhaps, Chabad's drive, the Rebbe's drive, to light a public menorah in the streets. Because if they, if they ain't coming into the synagogue, we're going to take the menorah to them. Are you with me? We're going to take it to the streets. This is guerrilla street Judaism happening. Right? So back in the day, understand this. Back in the day, perhaps, when the synagogue was very much a part of daily Jewish life, and again, it still is today, but when perhaps even more people came to synagogue on a daily basis, so you could light it in the synagogue, and that was your communal lighting. But today when there are many who go to synagogue, but also many who don't yet go to synagogue on a daily basis. So therefore, we take it to where people are. We put it in the street. We put it in a popular place. And there we light it in order to publicize the miracle. Take a look at text number five. This is the Rebbe's insight on this detail of the lighting, public menorah lightings. Alex, please read this one, page 158. The requirement is to place the menorah by the doorway of one's house from the outside, as Rashi explains, to publicize the miracle. Certainly, when, in addition to lighting inside the home, the menorah is actually lit outside, and in the most public place, the idea of publicizing the miracle is achieved in a greater measure. Thus, once again, it is encouraged, either like the days of Hanukkah, to light menorahs with a maximum measure of publicity. Namely, every city, town, or village to light a menorah in the most public place possible. At the same time, the assembled should be encouraged to light the menorah in their home as well. This, thank you, this the Rebbe said in 1986. This was the Rebbe's call in 1986. Not only to light a public menorah, but to light it in the most public space possible. Find the biggest intersection, find the most traffic. In Atlanta, I think there's a top competition, right? Where's going to be the most traffic uh, this time of year? Buckhead. Buckhead is definitely a place, yeah. Lennox, right? That area. The idea is to find, the Rebbe says, the Rebbe's call in 1986 was, find a public place, find the most public place, maximum exposure, maximum publicity, and light it there. Why? Because part and parcel of the midst of light in the menorah is pursuing Issa, publicizing the miracle. However, all of this is wonderful and good and true, and it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful insight already. However, we have a question. The question is, you know, we talk about pursuing Issa, publicizing the miracle, but really, to the streets? The original codification of the law, the way it's originally articulated in Talmud and the Code of Jewish Law, it talks about publicizing the miracle within the community. It talks about placing it outside your door in the neighborhood. It talks about lighting it by the window in your neighborhood. It talks about lighting it in the synagogue, in a Jewish house of worship. It doesn't say to light it in the middle of Times Square. It doesn't say it to light it by Grand Army Plaza. I'm talking about New York locations. It doesn't say to light it on the Belt Line or to light it on the ellipse across from the White House. Exactly. Or to light it right in front of the Eiffel Tower. 
or to light it uh, by the Kremlin, huh? Were you there? No. Oh. I watched it live. Yeah, they have a live stream. Years of Chabad. Ah. But the question is like this. Yes, there's a value, and yes, there's a necessity even, of pursuing Isa, publicizing the miracle. But the original meaning of publicizing the miracle seems to have been greatly expanded. The original notion of publicizing the miracle was to light it for your neighbors. Not for your neighbors, but to light it in, in eye shot of your neighbors. And to light it in the synagogue where the congregants can see it and celebrate together. That's not the same as putting up a giant 18-foot menorah in Cincinnati, or in Philadelphia, or in San Francisco, or in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, Pond City Market. It's not the same thing. But we know it so well, like You're saying, why do we need to publicize it? It seems like there's a message that, needs to, that we need to be reminded about. But my question is, Fine, and Niach, there's a reason that we need to... Let's, let's take for granted that, yes, there's something about Hanukkah that needs to be told and publicized. Even though we know it, it has to be publicized again. You know, they say that if big companies that everyone knows about, if they stop marketing, they would disappear. Even Coca-Cola, right? And who doesn't know Coca-Cola? If Coca-Cola didn't market... Because they could say, what, we need to tell people about Coca-Cola. Who doesn't know? It's, a, it's the bottle, the red can, whatever it is, right? We, we know what it is. If they stop marketing, they would drop. The sales would drop. And so there's something about pursuing these. Even though we all know the story of Hanukkah, I would say maybe we all know the story of Hanukkah because it's such a, it's such a festive, joyous, and public-facing holiday. But... It's part, it's part of the mitzvah obligation. But my question is, we're taking it, we're stretching it a little bit beyond its original parameters. The original parameters of publicizing the miracle were within the community. Now we're talking about expanding it everywhere, taking it to the streets. Since when is that part of the mitzvah? Since when is part of the mitzvah of Hanukkah to spread it to everyone in the city? Yeah. What would be the definition of what is the community? That if you the <coughs> definition, let's say the community of Jews in, in America is the community of Jews all over America, then the community is not necessarily just my local town. It's the person from another town like driving through. I'm with you. I'm with you. But you know what? If you do it in the middle of Pond City Market or in Decatur Square or in any other massive location, there are more people there that aren't Jewish who maybe this message, this holiday is not at all feeling relevant to them the, it, it, around than the Jews. Now the Jews will gather if you serve you know, donuts and latkes. I'm kidding. <laughs> Jews will gather because it's a, it's a Hanukkah party. Certainly, we're not, I'm, not, I'm not doubting that. But these are places where the majority of the time it's being, it's being seen by those who don't have the mitzvah necessarily to light the menorah. So the question is, I get it. If you're in a neighborhood, if you're in the shtetl, and you're lighting the menorah for your neighbors to see, it's wonderful. I get it. If you're in the synagogue and everyone's gathering there in the afternoon, you light the menorah for everyone to see and talk about the miracle, I get it. That's the original meaning of pursuing Issa, spreading, uh, publicizing the miracle, is amongst the community. But now we're talking about, you know, from the 19... I forget when the first public menorah lightings were. I want to say the 70s into the 80s, 90s, and today. Sounds like... Uh, uh, music station. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it evolved from something that's done on a communal level to something that's done on a much broader scale. Now, the question is, yes, there's the value of publicizing the miracle, but this seems to have expanded greatly beyond that original meaning. So let's discuss. So what is, what is the rationale behind doing this? In order to understand this, let's explore what we're calling in this in this book the great inaudible debate. Do you have that caption? Yeah. The great inaudible debate? Okay. And what this refers to is a massive fracture, a massive split amongst the Jewish community with regards to how to deal with openness and freedom. You know, there have been periods of time when Jews were persecuted when Jews were chased down, when Jews were forced to be segregated or forced to flee or forced to convert, all sorts of things. And then there arose a time in Europe 
when there was the great emancipation. Revolutions about the freedom of people and the, the ability of people to, uh, to, to serve however they want and whoever they want. Now, many times these, these movements of emancipation and freedom were followed by terrible tyranny and terrible hardship and terrible persecution, but there were moments of emancipation. And so the question is, how did Jewish communities deal with open borders? How did they deal with emancipation? And there were traditionally two camps. There was one camp that said, oh, emancipation, they're letting us live amongst the general populace. We can take on normal jobs. Baruch Hashem, thank God. Wonderful. For so long, we've been marginalized. We've been shoved in a ghetto, placed behind walls, told what we can and cannot do within society, pretty much shut out of the larger society. Now that we're enabled, now that we're allowed to be part of the larger society, that's what we need to do. We need to get into society and become like everyone else. We have to become the doctors and the lawyers and the philosophers and the musicians, all good things. But we need to become part of that culture, part of the larger society. You know the term the melting pot? So that would be, that would be this, uh, this approach. The approach is the melting pot approach. Let's become part of society and civilization. Let's take a look at text 6a. This is Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, which sounds very, uh, very divine. And he talks about in his book, A Judaism <laughs> Engaged with the World, he talks about this approach, which is again more of an assimilation type approach. And In place of assimilation and segregation, we need to argue the case for a Judaism that engages with the world. The case is not new. It is set out at the dawn of our history in two striking bi biblical portraits of Noah, Abraham, and his nephew Lot. Lot chose the way of assimilation as he tried to merge into the society, Sodom, in which he had chosen to live. His daughters married local men. We see Lot at the beginning of Genesis 19, sitting at the city gate, implying, as Rashi says, that he had been appointed a judge. Superficially, he seemed to have been accepted. He was soon to discover otherwise. Having welcomed strangers into his house, he found himself surrounded by an angry mob demanding that he hand them over. When he refuses, the mob say, this one came here as an immigrant, and now all of a sudden, he has set himself up as a judge, perhaps the first anti-Semitic remark in history. When the angels urge him to leave, he delays, fatefully trapped by his own ambivalence as to his real identity. Only when the angels drag him and his daughters out are their lives saved. Thank you. So here, Jonathan Sachs gives us a powerful perspective on the story of Lot. He frames the story of Lot, who moves to Sodom in a fascinating way. He says, what was the intention? The intention was to fit in. The intention, the intention was to be like the locals. And so he integrated. Yeah, his daughters, his daughters married the local men. He became a judge. And what happened at the end? What happened at the end is the moment he kind of evoked or awakened his values, what did they say to him? They said, look at you, you're an outsider, and now you're going to be our judge. In other words, as Jonathan Sachs says, probably the first anti-Semitic, perhaps, the first anti-Semitic, obviously, using that term loosely, um, remark in history. The bottom line is, he encounters difficulty, but let's leave that difficulty aside for a moment. What was his intention? His intention was to become part of the larger society. So there has been a movement ever since, and any at any point in history, Jewish history, when there's been more openness amongst the host society, there have been those many who have said, what is the best response to the openness? Let's become, part, let's become normal, a normal part of society. Why do we have to be so different? Maybe in our homes it could be a little bit different, but when we're out, let's be like everyone else. We're, they're accepting us, let's fit in. Let's be a good neighbor. Let's fit in. Okay, that's one approach. In other words, we'll just give one more way to understand this. Don't be so Jewy in the street. That's this approach. Don't, don't stand out like a sore thumb. Be like everyone else. And the home may be fine. But on the streets, fit in. 
That's one approach. Then we have the polar opposite approach. When the walls of the ghetto, wherever it happened, when those walls would come down, one approach, the first approach that we're setting, would say, great, let's roll, we're in. They're accepting us, let's sign up for the country club. The second approach was the polar opposite. The walls came down, let's put up our own walls. We have to create our own ghetto, insulate our families, not look at anything outside of our own four walls out of our own community. And this approach said that the world is treif. You know what that means? It's not kosher. The veld, the world is treif. Right? It's no good. It's dangerous. It's evil. You have to put blinders, right? You have to, when you're walking in the street, you have to look down. You can't look up and completely cut yourself off from society. So when the walls come down, you have to put up your own walls. This couldn't be any different than the first approach. The first approach says, the walls came down, great, let's integrate. The second approach says, the walls came down, uh-oh, that's dangerous. Because if we get involved, with what everyone else is getting involved in, we're going to lose our identity, we're going to lose our Judaism, it's going to get watered down, the whole thing is going to dissolve, we have to preserve what we have, we have to create our own solid walls and ceilings and boundaries. We have to re-ghetto ourselves. Who is this model? So if the model of integration is Lot, Lot says, I want to integrate. I want to become like the Sodomites, right? If that is Lot's approach, whose approach is it to say, I don't want anything else to do with, I don't want anything to do with anyone else? That is Noah's approach. Noah lived at a time of corruption. And what's his approach? What is it? Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. I don't mean exactly for, in the way that it's usually construed. What I mean is, he is putting blinders around himself, building an ark. See you later. Nice knowing you. I'm isolated. Text 6B. Let's pass it on. You got to let's pass it on. Dan, please read text 6B. A civic master, Rabbi Mendel of Kurs, once referred to a certain rabbi as a tzaddik in kilts, a righteous person in a fur coat. The Kotska explained. When it is winter and it's freezing cold, there are two things you can, one can do. One can build a fire, or one can wrap himself in a fur coat. In both cases, the person is warm, but when one builds a fire, all who gather around will be also warm. With a fur coat, the only one who is warm is the one who wears the coat. So it is regarding spiritual warmth. One can be ecstatic and a fur coat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm glad you laughs> An ominous. Uh, right. <laughs> so what is it tzaddik and pelts? It's tzaddik and pelts is someone who says, the world, the world is going down and I'm going to save myself. The ship is going down, I'm going to save myself. The world is freezing, I'm going to put on a fur coat and am I going to build a fire for others? <sighs> Who cares about others? I'm going to take care of myself. This is the approach of Noah. Noah is the one who builds the ark and he saves himself and he saves his family and he saves some animals or representation of all the animals and that's it. That's it. Does, doesn't, not, not interested in saving anyone else. He's not effective. He's not interested. He's not motivated to save others. It's about putting up the walls. I don't want to be corrupted by everyone in order for me not to be corrupted by others. Therefore, I need to disengage. I cannot be engaged with anyone else because they're all... They're all crazy. They're all mashuga. I'm going to stay within myself and my family, myself. We're going to be kosher, and that's it. We're going to be uh, like Hashem wants, and that's it. This is the opposite approach. The first approach is integration. The walls came down. Great. Let's join. Let's jump in. The second approach is walls came down. Now we're in trouble. Now we're in trouble. The next thing you know, it's going to infiltrate, and Judaism will disappear. Therefore, we need to put up the walls and protect ourselves. Now, here's the crazy thing. You cannot find two opposite movements, two opposite responses in Judaism than these. It's, it's like the polar opposite. One approach says assim assimilate and integrate. The second approach says 
ghetto, ghetto, ghetto. Re-ghetto ourselves. Completely different approaches. Min ha from one extreme to the other. And these two approaches don't agree on anything except for one thing. Both don't want a public menorah. You know why? The first group says, we need to assimilate. We need to integrate. We need to be like everyone else. Why are we putting up such big, massive Jewish symbols in the middle of the street? That seems to be uh, sticking out like a sore thumb. Why are we sticking out like a sore thumb? Let's be American and go to Macy's at Lenox, right? Let's go to Macy's. Let's do what everyone else does. Put up a Hanukkah bush. <laughs> Whatever it is, let's. But why? Why? Why put up an 18-foot menorah in a public square and say we're Jewish and dance the horror? Are you kidding me? What are we doing? We have to be like everyone else. We have to be normal, normal Americans. Let's just be normal. Why are we putting up a massive Jewish symbol sticking out like a sore thumb? Right? Let's just be like everyone else. That's one approach. That's the first approach. And the other side. The exact opposite side says the same thing. Well, it says a similar thing. They also say, why put up a public menorah? After all, it's all about protecting the community and staying within and not having anything to do with the outside world. So what? We're going to go to Pont City Market, Trafe, and we're going to go to Pont City Market and put up a religious, a holy mitzvah symbol. Fah! Who does that? Menorah is beautiful. It's holy. It's pure. Where does it belong? In the home. In the shul, in the synagogue. It doesn't belong in the streets. The streets are trafe, they're not kosher. You see what happened? You have two, two completely divergent approaches to Yiddishkeit, to Judaism, that have found a common enemy. And the common enemy is the public menorah. The public menorah doesn't work for the path of assimilation, because why are we doing that? Or integration. The public menorah also doesn't work for the path of ghettoization. Because that's not what that means. Ghettoization means you stay inside and you you don't you don't get involved outside. This is very much getting involved outside. Which brings us, of course, to a third approach. Like Jonathan Sachs said, there are three figures. There's Noah. Well, let's go in order. There's Lot, all about the integration. There's Noah, all about the segregation. And then there's, of course, as he said, there's Avram. And what was Avram about? Avram was about, sorry? Hospitality. Hospitality. And he was about teaching the world. This is really important. Who did he teach about monotheism? Anybody who can do it. He taught everybody. He took it to the streets. He was the originator of, what I said before, guerrilla Judaism. Judaism begins on the streets. Okay. Let's, let's unpack this. Let's really understand this. The way I want to do this, and the way this class is uh, formulated, which I like, is, uh, is based on the verses. This is not going to be some newfangled theory. This is not going to be some new agey approach or some you know, third, com third way compromise approach. This is straight up based on scripture, based on Torah, based on Tanakh. When I say Torah, I mean five books. Based on Nach, based on the prophets. Let's, let's read some text. Text 7a, page 161. I'll read this. This is from Devarim Deuteronomy. Behold, I have taught you statutes and ordinances. As the, as the Lord my God commanded me to do so in the midst of the land to which you are coming to possess. And you shall keep them and do them. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the eyes of the peoples, who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is at all times that we call upon him? And which great nation is it? that has just statutes and ordinances as this entire Torah, which I set before you this day. This is Moshe, Moses speaking to the Jewish people shortly before his passing. And he's telling them that when you, when I pass on and you're on your own and you're traveling or you're in, in the land of Israel and you're encountering other people, you know what you need to be doing? You need to be following the Torah. And when you follow the Torah and you do mitzvot, you know what people are going to say? They're not going to, they're not going to look at it you know, and say, what is this? But rather, ultimately, what are they going to say? They're going to say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. 
In other words, this will have a positive impression upon others. There's a positive message that is born of Torah and mitzvot. Let's take a look at text 7b. Arise, shine from Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has shone upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a gross darkness the kingdoms, and the Lord shall shine upon you, and his glory shall appear over you. And nations shall go by your light, and kings by the brilliance of your shine. What does this tell us? This tells us that Judaism is not just an insular responsibility, but Judaism has a responsibility. Or Judaism calls us to be a light unto others. And if that wasn't spelled out clear enough in 7b, here we have the ultimate clarity of 7c. So said God, the Lord, the creator of heavens, and, and the one who stretched them out, who spread out the earth, and what springs forth from it, who gave a soul to the people upon it, and a spirit to those who walk thereon. So basically this is what God says. Quote, I am God. I called you with righteousness, and I will strengthen your hand. And I formed you, and I made you for a people. I made you for a people's covenant, for a light to nations. If you ever wonder where the phrase, a light unto the nations, come from, comes from, this is where it comes from, Isaiah 42, verse number 6. Yeah, we're meant to be a light unto the nations. What does that mean? What it means is that we're meant to be a good example and shine a positive example of belief in God, belief in something higher, and living a noble life to the entire world. It's not just something that we're speak, preaching to the choir. It's something that we're meant to be teaching or really modeling to every single human being. Let's take a look at what the Radak says. Rabbi David Kimchi, text number eight. Matt, please read this. This is the Radak's commentary. He's a biblical com Sorry, he's a commentary on scripture. He comments on this last uh, verse about light to the nations. Credit to the Jews. The non-Jews will keep the seven Noahide laws, leading them in a good and just path, similar to what is stated, and let him teach us of his ways, and we will go in his path. So the Radak says that what is a primary Jewish mission is to teach the entire world to keep the seven Noahide laws. And the seven Noahide laws are the seven laws that were given to Adam, Harishon, the first human being, and Noah. And they are basic laws of civility and morality and monotheism is in there as well. But it's basic, I don't mean basic like easy, but I mean fundamental basic. Basic, fundamental, essential, positive, healthy, just, righteous behavior. And the message is that God is telling us that we're meant to not just influence a fellow Jew with 613 mitzvot, but we're, we're meant to influence every human being to act in a just and kind and righteous manner. Let's take a look at text 9. Maimonides has even stronger language. Steve, please read this. Moses, <clears throat> Moses was commanded by God to compel all the inhabitants of the world to accept the commandments given to Noah, Noah's descendants. Look at this. He says to compel. Now, it doesn't mean obviously by, you know, actually mm -hmm. compel in a, in, a, in a violent way, but it means to to work with, to, you know, to convince, to compel, etc. Continue. Anyone who accepts upon himself the fulfillment of these seven mitzvot and is precise in their observance is considered one of the pious among the Gentiles and will merit a share in the world to come. So here we have Rambam telling us that the seven Noahide laws are critical for all of humanity. It's like that denim company. Seven for all mankind. Right? That's what it is. But what the, the amazing thing here is, and I, we can't lose sight of this connection, it's not just that the Torah tells us that all people must be keeping the seven laws of, of Noah, the seven Noahide laws, but it's more than that. It's telling us that it's a primary Jewish mission to teach the world about the seven Noahide laws. That's the idea, that's the big idea. Which means that we have now a third approach. There is one approach that says, become like everyone else, integrate, assimilate. 
Another approach says, no, 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 isolate and segregate yourselves. Don't have any involvement. And the third approach is, you need to be out there in the world, but not to assimilate, but rather to educate. So we have the path of assimilate, that's one extreme. The other extreme is the path of segregate. Isolate. isolate. We're trying to keep the keep it rhyming, right? Good. So we have integrate or assimilate, segregate or isolate, and the third path is educate. No, educate, 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 educate. Our lagoyim, a light to the nations. Be a light unto all nations. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at, at what the Rebbe says in text number 12. I love this. Text 12. Um, who just read? Steve, you just read? Okay. David, please read this, page 167. Fulfilling the seven Noahide laws is an integral part of the creation of the world. For he did not create it for the waste. He formed it to be inhabited namely the civilized world, which is the central purpose of the seven Noahide laws. The Rebbe says, what's the vision? What was God's vision of the world? It's a world where human beings are living a good life, treating each other with care, laws, law and order, morality, goodness, compassion, belief in something higher, belief in God. That's the world that God wants. And when the world is on that page, that's what, that's, that's the, then the mission is fulfilled. What greater Mashiach is there than a world in which people aren't trying to kill each other or rob each other blind or harm each other or cut each other down, right? With a world without violence, without jealousy, without anger, without hostility, that's the world we're all waiting for. And that's the world that happens when all of humanity, is living with these seven Ohide laws. And so here we have, again, a, a radically different approach to what we're meant to do once the walls come down. So the walls come down, and now you, you and I can do whatever, you, whatever we want. So what are we going to do? Are we going to join the country club? Are we going to put up other walls, our own walls? Or are we going to say, Baruch Hashem, thank God, I now have an opportunity. Now that the walls are down, I can get a positive, global, universal message out to others, and maybe, just maybe, others are going to listen to me. Maybe others will hear, because I'm no longer behind the wall. So now my voice, my call, can get out there to the world. The Rebbe said again and again and again that our shlichut, our mission, when I say our, I mean the Jewish mission is not just to teach a fellow Jew about the 630 mitzvot, but to teach the entire world about the seven Noahide laws. And the Rebbe got a lot of heat for this. The Rebbe got a lot of criticism, or some criticism. Other rabbis said, why is the Lubavitcher Rebbe talking about uh, educating people that aren't Jewish? Why is that important? Why is that important? And the Rebbe clarified and he said, oh, they said not only why is, that, why is that important, they said that's never been done before. A new Judaism. Since when has this been a thing? Since when has this been a movement to teach the world about the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, the seven Ohad laws? Since when? It's never been a thing. What kind of campaign is this? The Rebbe said, it's a very simple explanation. Of course we've never done this before. Because for the last several centuries, many centuries, we've been running for our lives. And we've been persecuted. And so when you're when somebody's chasing you out of their country, what are you going to say? Hey, don't forget those seven hundred laws on the way out. Like, what, how are you going to influence? You have no platform, right? You have no platform to influence. You're being, God forbid, chased and persecuted and hunted and forced to convert, etc. So how are you influencing? You have no platform. The Rebbe says in in America, in the twentieth century, okay, and in the twenty first century, thank God. We have a platform. We have the freedom. So we can do whatever we want with the freedom. We can choose to totally integrate 
and to on some level dilute who we are. We can choose to try to retain everything that we are and only focus on self like the tzaddik in the fur coat and says, I don't want to have anything to do with the outside world. And the Rebbe said, both of these approaches are not the ideal. The ideal approach is to be committed to what you're committed to, but to also be out there and to be teaching and to be inspiring every single human being. This is why the Rebbe pushed for the public menorah. You see, the ones who, the camp that says, just integrate, be an American, be normal. They, they have a problem with the menorah. They have a problem with the menorah. Why are you putting up a big menorah, a big Jewish symbol? Let's, let's, let's take it easy here, this whole Jewishness. Light a menorah, light it at home. I'm not saying don't light a menorah, but light it at home, light it in the synagogue. Light it at the JCC. Why are you lighting it in Decatur Square? What are you doing? City Hall, why? The other camp says, who, why are you going outside of the community? Why are you going out into Times Square at all? Why are you riding a subway? Who does that? Right? Put the blinders up and that's it. Gandhi. And the Rebbe's approach is, go out there. And when you go out there, you have a mission, you have a calling. Go out there to teach and influence in a positive, loving, warm, elevatory manner. Teach in a way that inspires others to be the best human being that they can be. And this is what the public menorah is about. The public menorah stands as a symbol not exclusively of Judaism, but rather of, number one, religious freedom, and number two, the notion of light over darkness and morality over immorality and justice over injustice. The menorah stands primarily for the notion of goodness over evil. And this is something that's a universal message. And so therefore, lighting the Hanukkah menorah in public is a statement. Number one, it's a direct message, an educational message to everyone. And number two, it's a message that this is what our mission is. Our mission is to educate everyone those inside the tent, so to speak, and those outside the tent. Let's take a look at a text. Let's find the, the text that really clarifies this. Oh, text 16. You can't get any more direct than text 16. This is again from 1986. Sandrine, I think we're up to you. Page 172. 16. Text 16, yeah. Lighting the menorah outside affects, affects all, the, all of the people situated outside including the non-Jews. Therefore, we should utilize the public menorah lighting as an opportunity to promote the seven Noah laws. The Rebbe said, when we are lighting the public menorah, it's a beautiful opportunity to teach everyone gathered there, not just about the mitzvah or the holiday of Hanukkah itself and the mitzvah of lighting the menorah, but about the basic universal, when I say basic, not easy, but the essential universal laws of humanity, the seven Noahide laws, that's a good platform to teach that. And so, here we have a radically new approach to why the public menorah. At first we said, well, public menorah, because Hanukkah is all about publicizing the miracle. But then we asked, publicizing the miracle to who? To everyone. And the Rebbe's answer was, yeah, to everyone because that's our mission. And again, like I said before, there's two messages here. One message is that the message of Hanukkah is relevant to everyone. And the second message is our mission. We stand at a critical moment in history. At this moment in history, we don't only live particular lives. Our lives are not meant to be lived in isolation. We're not meant to be the tzaddik and the fur coat. You see, I could have put on a winter coat and left it on like 58 degrees in here, but no, we warmed up this whole space. Why? Because we're all meant to be warm. And similarly, we're not meant to put on a fur coat. We're also not meant to just jump in with everyone else. We're meant to be proud, be strong of who we are, and then educate and illuminate and warm up the outside as well. This is the message of the public menorah. The public menorah stands tall, but it also stands for much more than meets the eye. It stands for the unique moment in time that we find ourselves 
with a platform to truly influence others. Let's, let's conclude with one final text, text number 17. Um, Dr. Maxi, if you can read this, text 17, page 172. This goes back to Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. I discovered that non-Jews respect Jews who respect Judaism. Non-Jews are embarrassed by Jews who are embarrassed by Judaism. The menorah is a brilliant way to promote our beautiful heritage for all to see, to be that beacon of light unto the nations which all can see. To echo the prayer of Hanukkah, may the light of the public menorah shine forth in those days and in these times. And I think we can conclude with that text and say, Amen. 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 Thank you for joining me tonight for Torah Studies Hanukkah Edition. Thank you very much.